All right. Well, hello, everybody. Um, thank you, Hunter. I seem to have gotten the dress code a little confused, but maybe you did. I don't know. Um, thank you. I appreciate looking good. Um, so it's a pleasure to be here share a little bit about the work that we've been doing with the support of the Filecoin Foundation for the Distributed Web. A um, little bit different than a lot of the other things that you've heard about today. And so that's either an invitation to tune in or tune out, you choose. There's a picture of a library here because about 10 years ago, I had a conversation that I was thinking about yesterday. A friend of mine working in healthcare in Africa said, you know, it's, it's such a shame. There's all of this knowledge, all of these grants made by USAID and the big development aid players, the Gates Foundation, Wellstone Trust. Almost 50% of healthcare in Africa is funded by grants. Think about that. It's crazy. 50% of a continent's healthcare. And we don't know what's working. But they have to submit reports. They have to submit reports on all of that money and say what worked or didn't work. All that knowledge is there. And so this person's idea was to make a library. They wanted to aggregate all of the grant reports from all of the publicly funded projects across Africa so that people could come together and research. We played that out a little bit. Logistically, it seems impossible. And rather got into a conversation about the fact that these were all submitted as PDFs or Word documents. They all had a similar structure. Theoretically, there's no reason that you couldn't start developing an ontology, using a little MLAI, scraping those, and then having a searchable database of all of this information, theoretically. Open Society Foundation did it on all of their Roma programs. It's been done. Would people do it? Maybe. What if you gave them a reason that they had to? So if somebody submitted a grant application, they had to reference prior work to say that they were going to replicate something, that they were going to look at something that had been done and try it differently because they didn't think that the results were quite accurate the first time, or that it was entirely new work, and that each grant made would actually be additive to human knowledge about what worked and didn't work in healthcare. This was 10 years ago. And as I sat here yesterday, I was like, man, I wish I'd known all you people. Because if we're talking about the sum of human knowledge and distributed knowledge, man, it would have been great if we'd had this back then. We didn't, and so it didn't go anywhere. But maybe it's time. Because there's a theory about civil society, the community I work in, the nonprofit, non-governmental sector, that civil societies like humanity's white blood cells. We are the immune system of the human race. One person sees a problem in their community, and like a white blood cell, they want to fix that infection. They go try to cure that ill. And if it doesn't work, they bring their friends. Voluntary action. They get a group together. They cluster around it, and they try to fix it. And if that doesn't work, they formalize. They start a nonprofit. Many of you have interacted with nonprofits in your life, after school programs, theater groups, swim teams, churches, all sorts of good stuff that the nonprofit sector gets together to do, political action. And if they get good enough, maybe they get to the point where they change legislation. They rewrite the rules of society, and they cure whatever that ill was. They cut it out entirely. If you think about that metaphor, it's fascinating. Like the library story, you have 10 million nonprofits on the planet, give or take. Nobody knows. You have an order of magnitude more informal organizations. Nobody exactly knows. The best estimates are that this is a $4 trillion segment of the global economy. 10 to 20% of the workforce in the United States, more people work in the nonprofit sector than work in manufacturing. It's bananas. It's a huge, huge community. And every day, all they exist to do is get up, 
work on whatever problem bothers them, fix it, leave the world a better place. By the millions, think of that knowledge. Think of what they witness, what they see, what is broken in policy, what is missing in policy, what is working in policy. And they have every reason to bring that knowledge to the forefront for the communities they care about, to get it right, to leave the world better. It's a fascinating thing to think about when you think about distributed web. The fundamental principles of distributed web, the distribution, the democratization, the self-determination, all of these things, the philosophies, the fundamental tenements are so similar. And to me, that's what makes this community so exciting. It's also the promise of that going unfulfilled that drove me to start an organization called Connect Humanity. Because it's a beautiful promise, yet half of humanity isn't online. One in two people on the planet is not on the internet. One in two. When was the last time anybody in here had trouble getting online? One in two people can't access work online. 80% of jobs in the United States are only posted online. One in two people can't get there. In the US, it's 120 million Americans don't have broadband. A third of our economy, 40, uh, 40 million Americans have no internet at all. So all that promise, the hope of something like distributed web coming together with the sort of social justice community and all that they know and could do, again, a little bit unfulfilled. So the organization, Connect Humanity, we work with communities who do not have the internet. We help them design, build, own, and operate their own infrastructure. So through grants and loans, we help communities build fiber networks. We help communities build wireless networks. We work on device access and digital literacy training so that they can be a part of this. So that distributed web isn't something that's super exciting for a few people. And part of our work was bringing this community of civil society behind this question about where are they now. If we want to see this sort of realized future, good to know where we're starting, good to have a conversation with people about what they want. So like good policy dorks that we are, we ran a survey. Fun times. Thank you, Filecoin, for being a part of it. And we reached out through TechSoup, Civicus, Forest, Wings, other global civil society networks, to the nonprofit community around the world. I think we did 25 languages to ask sort of what people had and did not have when it came to the fundamental pillars of digital equity access, affordability, devices, training and security. Did they have the internet? Was it cheap enough? Was it fast enough? Did they have devices? Did they have people who could help them learn how to use them? Did they feel safe online or not? And for the communities that they cared about, the people they serve, what was their sort of relationship to digital equity as sort of a baseline? And we had about 12,000 organizations open the email start reading, we had 7,558 complete it. It's a fairly good sample size, about 100 countries. If any of you done survey work, more than 7,500 surveys is nothing to, you know, cry about. And what did they say? What did they say? Well, nothing that really surprised us. More than 90% of the organizations that we reached said that the internet was critical to their work. Just over 80% of them said that not having the internet in their communities had disrupted their work, that they could not fulfill their missions without the internet, without devices, without feeling safe online. 7,500 organizations who collectively serve nearly 200 million people. It's 200 million people who go unserved 
sometimes, often, because of lack of the internet. This was particularly acute during the pandemic. A survey that I ran at TechSoup before starting Connect Humanity, 82% of nonprofits were able to pivot their services online, but their communities couldn't access them. The kinds of services that these organizations are providing are food security, their food banks, they're feeding people, they're shelters, they're housing people, they're educating people, they're domestic violence shelters. They are providing critical services, and there is no safety net beneath these organizations. So when they fail, society fails. And society failing is now uniquely digital. So this issue, this issue of digital equity is one that isn't just about sort of access to the future goods, it's about quality of life and survival right now for hundreds of millions of people on the planet. Again, repeated in the survey, what did we learn? Well, we'll certainly publish this. I, again, I don't think we necessarily learned much. What did they learn? Uh, that's a different discussion. 7,500 organizations around the world thought about the concept of digital equity for the first time. The real reason we did this was not just to get answers to questions that we already kind of knew the answers to. It was to build a community of people who had a shared language about what they needed, who had a way of looking at the internet not as something that happens or doesn't happen, but as something that they have an active reason and role in procuring for their communities. They are stakeholders in digitalization, not sort of victims or subjects to it. Of this community, we had roughly, well, all of them said they wanted to see the survey results. I do too. It'll be fully published in about a week. You can follow us online if you want, geek out about these things with us. About half of them, so nearly 3,000, said, so just under half, said that they wanted to keep participating in a conversation. So we are in the second of three conversations about the internet that people want. They told us what they have. These are conversations about what people want going forward. I am so sad that I didn't just rickroll all of you. I very much considered <laughs> doing that. Ugh, next time, next time. Um, so the, current, the first conversation, we had several hundred organizations around the world talk about the specific stories and challenges they had with access, really helping contextualize this issue. The second set that's going on right now is about the future of the distributed web. It's about this intersection that I was speaking about earlier between the principles of distributed technologies, the principles of civil society, and how they might come together. The next one, starting in two weeks, is about financing digitalization. Because the corporate sector isn't doing it, they've served the people they think are rich enough, governments are frankly kind of messing it up, civil society and foundations need to get in and build a market. Sort of core to what we do, building community around that. But this one right now, we could use your help. Everybody in here is very close to the conversation about distributed web. Most of civil society is not. They want to learn. They want to partner. These are people who philosophically are our allies, and they want to be a part of this fight so that we end up with the internet that we need, not the internet that we all talked about earlier, which is the one we don't want very much. So if you have a moment, hop in there share some ideas, comment on other people's ideas, have some fun, be a part of this. Because as the world goes through climate change, the sort of dwindling of democracy as we know it, the fourth industrial revolution, the mega trends of our time, this is the community, civil society, who's the only community that will serve human dignity, will serve as the moral compass to guide us through. That's their job. They need the technologies that are aligned with their philosophy and their reason to be the most successful and help all of us get through some rather special times ahead. So thank you. Come play. Oh.